Let us worship God as we gather together. This morning we do so in the presence of the Almighty with hearts that are drawn to him to lift up our praise and worship. And we'll begin by singing from Psalm 65. Psalm 65, and we'll sing verses 1 to 5 to the tune Glasgow, which is tune number 66. Psalm 65, verses 1 to 5. Here we give praise to the Lord as our Savior. We rejoice in the gospel of his free grace. Notice how this uh, comes out in verse 3. Iniquities, I must confess, prevail against me do. But as for our transgressions, them purge away shalt thou. Blessed is the man whom thou dost choose and makest approach to thee, that he within thy courts, O Lord, may still a dweller be. We surely shall be satisfied with thy abundant grace and with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy place. Sing together verses 1 to 5.
time together for prayer. Our glorious God in heaven, we come to you, the creator of heaven and earth, and we confess that the heavens themselves show forth your glory and the firmament of the of your handiwork uh, brings forth and preaches your praise that even the mountains and the hills uh, break forth with shouts of praise unto you the trees of the field clap their hands and you have told us that if the sons of men would fall dumb and silent before you, that the very rocks of the earth would break forth with praise. And so, O Lord, we come privileged. We come as those delighting in the access that we have into the throne room of heaven. We count ourselves to be blessed of all the earth, uh, to behold the glory and majesty of such a great God. And we do, O Lord, adore you, and we love you, and we rejoice in the fullness of your grace. We rejoice in the good news, the coming of of your Son, the Word made flesh to tabernacle among us, he who was full of grace and truth. We are thankful that he is the day spring, risen on high, the light of the world, and that in him we have light and life. And you have come, O Lord, delighting to pour out mercy upon needy sinners. The Lord Jesus himself testifying that he came not to save the righteous, but to call sinners unto repentance, the likes of us who have walked in the ways of iniquity and who have transgressed your holy law, who are polluted within and defiled without. We come, O Lord, acknowledging our great need uh, for you. You are a God of jealousy, a God who strives uh, with your people and who watches over us as a husband watches over uh, his bride. And we confess with our fathers of old that we have been unfaithful Uh, that we have uh, not kept uh, all that has been required of us in your equitable and holy law, but rather we have sinned. We pray that you would give us grace, that we would rend our hearts and not our garments, that we would have broken spirits before you and not just uh, tongues which mouth the words of, of repentance. Uh, we plead, O Lord, that you, would, that you would come and search us out, that as we are going to sing in a few moments, that you would examine us and try us, and that you, O Lord, would be pleased uh, to, to do a good and gracious work in our hearts, leading us uh, to flee continually to the Lord Jesus, putting all of the weight of our souls upon him as our great and gracious Redeemer. We come pleading his merits. We come acknowledging uh, that he has accomplished all that is needful for our salvation, that nothing falls to our hand and we have nothing but empty hands to bring to you. And with that, we then lay hold afresh this morning of you by faith, our feet being fixed upon the promises of your word and asking that you would give us much joy in the liberation of that is found in Christ. Surely our great Passover has been sacrificed for us. Surely uh, he is our jubilation, our great jubilee who has set the captives free. We are thankful, O Lord, for this, uh, the riches of your grace, and we ask that you would enable us to come and to soak ourselves in the message of that grace and that we would find ourselves consoled and strengthened in the walk that you have given to us. Uh, Fortify us, O Lord, against all of the the beatings and the battery of of temptation from our own indwelling sin, which betrays us, having committed treason, as it were. 
We confess, O Lord, the enticements and entanglements, the trinkets of the world that seek to allure us, and then all of the forces of the supernatural power of Satan himself, these great enemies uh, pursuing us. But we are thankful that you are our strength and shield. We're thankful that when the enemy comes in like a flood, you raise up a standard against him. We're thankful that the shield of faith quenches his fiery darts, that when your people resist him, he, he must flee from them. And so we, we come looking away to our great captain, our king, our governor, the Lord Jesus, asking that we might find shelter under his wing, and that you would deliver us from all of the the, uh, the tribulations and trials that we face in this world, that we would count to ourselves blessed, that we would look with privilege, even joy, upon those ways and incidents in which we suffer in Christ's name and on Christ's behalf. We ask, O oh Lord, that we would be given grace to shoulder uh, those sufferings, in faith and holiness before you. Look with mercy upon your people. Uh, We are too weak, O Lord, to carry uh, the burdens that you have allotted in providence, and we need your divine help that uh, your power would be made perfect in our weakness. And so come and grant unto your people your favor. Impart to them strength and help us as we lay aside uh, all of the claims that are made upon us throughout our work week. And as we then devote ourselves this day to your worship in public and private, the exercise of our souls, make it truly a a heavenly rest for us. We pray that our, our, our hearts would be refreshed in the public means of grace, that we would be equipped and fortified, that we would take with us your provision. Give unto us, O Lord, hearts which hunger and thirst for righteousness, which come with with sincere spiritual appetites to your, uh, the banquet of your word. And we pray that our mouths would be filled, that you would send us away satiated and nourished and strengthened in all that you have called us to. We commit our cares to you, praying, O oh Lord, that you would uh, grant unto us a sense of, of uh, otherworldly favor amidst all of the, the distractions and difficulties in relationships, in the workplace, amidst families, uh, the practical, logistical uh, forces that are pressed upon us. Grant, Lord, wisdom from heaven, that wisdom which is from above, which is first pure and peaceable. We ask that you would guide and direct us in the paths of of life. Uh, We pray for those who are looking especially into the face of acute trials, whether uh, the spiritual uh, assaults and burdens of loss and affliction, or uh, the physical and temporal pains that are faced in this world, buoy them up. Grant, Lord, that they would be lifted up with eagle's wings to mount, to not grow weary, uh, to wait upon you, to be of good courage, to, to find the promise that you do grant strength. Uh, we thank you as well, O Lord, for blessing and pray that you would help us to re- rejoice with those who rejoice and that you would sanctify to us, especially uh, days of prosperity and of ease and of uh, the gifts that you shower upon us. We thank you for the many answers to copious prayers which have been raised on behalf of uh, one of our members who was with child and who now has brought forth uh, another uh, covenant child, we give you the, the honor and the glory and the praise for the mercies given in labor and delivery, for the health and strength of both mother and child. And we pray, O oh Lord, uh, that these uh, early initial uh, blessings would only give way to you lavishing far and above and beyond all that we might ask or think, further blessing in the days ahead. Raise up to yourself a godly seed uh, from among our covenant children and grant that they would be like Daniel, purposing in their hearts not to defile themselves, uh, looking away to Christ, faith in the gospel, pursuit of holiness, 
We look, O Lord, asking that you would shower these blessings upon us. We ask for the unconverted among us and pray that you would that you would strive with them, that you would contend and overthrow uh, the unbelief and opposition which is raised against the preaching of your gospel, that you would subdue them and bring them uh, by faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, We look away asking and waiting and expecting and pleading that you would save sinners among us and that your gospel would not be seen to return in vain, but that it would bring forth with power great fruitfulness among us. Bless the cause of Christ in the churches within our community and within our presbytery. Bless as our denomination prepares in a couple of weeks for General Assembly. Grant, Lord, that all would be put in order and that there would be, uh, that this uh, season would be one full of of, uh, advance among our ranks. Uh, Grant, Lord, that our small and feeble voice would be raised like a trumpet and that the light which we carry would burn like a bright torch, that we would be a city set upon a hill, found faithful in our own generation, contending uh, for the faith once for all delivered to the saints and holding fast to the form of sound words. And we ask, O Lord, that you would uh, look with Uh, special pity upon the work of missions. Bless those in Zambia, your servant there, his family. Protect them from malaria, disease, snake bites. Uh, Grant that their children would be kept uh, in the hollow of your hand. Bless those labors among the Zambian pastors. May they be discipled and furnished with truth with which they will feed their own flocks. And may it be, O Lord, the beginning of a great work in seeing Zambia and the heart of Africa itself engulfed in the light of truth, superstition and false religion overthrown, supplanted uh, by the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. We plead, O Lord, for these mercies, and we ask for help now as we wait upon you in worship. Uh, Grant unto us that you would be drawing us, uh, even as we are seeking you, that you would draw us and Bring down blessing upon our heads. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing together from Psalm 26. Psalm 26, verses 1 to 7. The tune is Eden. This is a new tune. This is the first Sabbath, as you know, of May. And so we'll be looking at this tune, learning this tune together the month ahead. Ask our presenter in just a moment to sing through Eden, which is tune number 55, before we sing the text. Notice um, notice verses 2 and 3, examine me and do me prove, try heart and reins, O God, for thy love is before mine eyes, thy truth's paths I have trod. Let's sing together. Uh, Verses 1 to 7, and if the presenter would first sing through the tune.
turn now in the reading of God's holy word to the Old Testament prophet Joel. We'll read together from Joel chapter 2. Prophet Joel, second chapter. Beginning at verse 1. Let's give careful heed to the reading of God's word. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, and as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth a stubble as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks, neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, They shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up upon the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, For his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me. With all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil, who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, Assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad, and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, and the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you 
the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat and the fats shall overflow with, with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. It shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Thus far the reading of God's inspired word. To his name be all of the praise and honor and glory. Let's turn back together to Psalm 26. We'll sing now the second half of the psalm, beginning at verse 8, Psalm 26, verses 8 to 12. The tune is St. Thomas, which is tune number 127, tune 127. Verse 8, we, we sing, The habitation of thy house, Lord, I have loved well. Yea, in that place I do delight, where doth thine honor dwell. Sing verses 8 to the end.
turn now our attention again to the reading of God's holy word, this time in the New Testament book of Romans. We'll read together from chapter 5, Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Listen to what God says. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a a righteous man will one die, Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God bless the reading of his holy word. going to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to the book of Titus. For those who have been with us, you'll know we have been engaged in a series of sermons working our way by exposition through Titus, and we come this morning to Titus chapter 3, and our text is verses 4, 5, and 6. Titus 3, verses 4, 5, and 6. Let's read together from verse 3 through verse 7. 
For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We'll look together at verses 4 to 6. You can have a person who has been hospitalized and who is physically plagued with some horrible disease, and there they lie in pain, wasting away in their sickness, perhaps the threat of death looming over top of their heads. And there are a couple things that have to happen in order for that person to receive some hope. First of all, there has to be a provision of medicine, of something that will cure or heal their disease. But then secondly, there has to be the application of that medicine to them. And so scientists can do their research, pharmaceutical companies or others can produce uh, a substance that may Uh, yield healing. Pharmacies can purchase these things and have them in store. People can have money to buy them. And all of that is indispensable. If it doesn't exist, then it can be of no help. But we don't just stop there. It may be, as it were, available. It may have been procured. But something additional is needed, isn't it? It needs to be given. It needs to be received. It needs to be applied to that sick, dying patient lying in a hospital bed, put into their IV or mouth in order to impart uh, the healing virtues uh, to them. And this this illustrates for us something about the, the history of redemption, about the work of salvation. God has sent forth his Son in the fullness of time, and he has accomplished salvation. This is something done in history. It's something that is final. It is something that has been uh, procured by God himself. The Lord Jesus Christ lived under the law, died upon the cross, buried, raised, ascended to heaven, and poured out his Holy Spirit. And so all all that is needful for the eternally and terminally sick, sin-sick soul has been accomplished. It's all been procured. And so here we have the Lord working salvation, purchasing salvation. It's available. But what God has accomplished, God must also apply. And so all of the the resources that are found in Christ in his person, in his work, all that has been procured by him for his people is then applied to the individual soul, the individual Christian. And we have what Christ, who Christ is and what he's done brought down and applied to the souls of men in order that they might be forgiven and freed from the penalty of death, the curse of the law, forgiven and received into the favor, the good favor and acceptance of God. So we see redemption accomplished and and applied. Both of these, both redemption accomplished and redemption applied, shout mercy. It shows the mercy of God. In accomplishing salvation, it is mercy that God is pursuing and displaying. In applying salvation, it is mercy that God is displaying and showering upon his people. And so as you go back to Titus 3 here, where we find ourselves in our our series, you look at what we ended with last week in verse 3, 
and you have this breakneck cosmic speed from misery to mercy. He says, look at who you were. Pay attention. Put on your glasses. Inspect. Investigate. Consider. Reflect upon. Ponder. This is you. Not someone else. This is you. This is, this is who you are and how you are born into the world. Foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts, and so on. It is a miserable state. And yet he takes us from verse 3 to the, what follows, from, mercy to, uh, from misery to mercy, from being condemned to being converted. And the source is brought out, especially at the beginning here in verse 4, it is the love of God. The mercy of God. So let's look at three things this morning. First of all, the Savior has appeared. First of all, the Savior has appeared. Verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. It has appeared. Against the backdrop of our sin, in verse 3. Against the backdrop of the bad news. No one comes to Christ without having to face the music of the bad news of their sin and the just condemnation under that sin. Against that backdrop, the glory of God's love is set on display. You think of perhaps hiking along a river, and little did you know, but there's a paper mill that's down that river, and the wind's blowing. And so you, you, you end up being engulfed in this fetid, repulsive odor of a paper mill. And it's thick, and you can't escape it. And it turns the stomach, and it's nauseating. Everything about it is putrid. And there you are stuck. And then all of a sudden, unexpectedly, you have a, a sweet, crisp, breeze blowing from a different direction that cuts through that fetid air and hits you in the face. And all of a sudden there's this, there's this uh, relief, the refreshment of that sweet, crisp breeze uh, coming along. This is where we find ourselves in the text. We're coming up out of the, the reality of verse 3 and we're hit full in the face with the, the sweetness of the love of of God. He says, you see yourself in verse 3, now see the Savior. Look, he says, at what has appeared, the kindness, the kindness, literally the bountifulness of God and his love. God is in essence good and full of bounty, but in love he communicates and imparts that to his, his people. And it says it's appeared Where? Not in creation. We see the glory of God as a creator, as a sustainer. We see his wrath and power in creation. We can't look, as it were, to the heavens or to the the great seas and find this appearance. Where is it? He has appeared in the person of his Son. It is not in creation, but in the incarnation. The coming of Christ as the Word made flesh, the God-man, that this love, this kindness has appeared to us. It is the Lord's love that elects a people for himself. It is the Lord's love that regenerates, as this passage says, that renews, as this passage says, that justifies, as we see in verse 7, that glorifies, as we see at the end of verse 7. It is his love from beginning to end. God's love chooses God's love sends his son. God's love comes and regenerates and gives us the spirit, justifies us, and then ultimately glorifies us on the last day. And over the top of all of this, his banner over us is love, in the words of the Song of Songs. Vessels of Destruction made vessels of mercy, as Romans 9 tells us. And it is nothing in you, it is all in him. 
It is not you that make a lick of difference regarding your standing before the Lord. It is his kindness and his love that secures us in being reconciled to Christ. And so we're, we're rising out of the mire, if you will. We're like, we're like coal miners. We've dwelt in the depths of the earth. Our habitation has been darkness. Our habitation has been a dark hole. And as we come up out of the earth, we have the light hitting our faces, blinding us, causing us to, to squint. And all of a sudden, we're, we're surrounded by the, the brilliant light of the sun. And what does that do? It only exposes further uh, the, the grime and filth. And we see that from the tip of our toes to the top of our head, we're covered in this mire. We're covered in the filth of, of sin. But the Lord says, ah, I am causing light to shine upon you. I'm brought, bringing you out of the depths of the earth. And what's more, there is a spring and a fountain that is immediately at the door of, of this mine, as it were. And the Lord says, here, flee to this fountain, and I will wash you, and I will make you clean. Go to the fountain. It is found in the Lord Jesus Christ who can cleanse us from all of our sin. And we're left having to say, who? Tell me, who in all of, of the universe is like unto thee? Who is like unto thee? The day spring lavishing grace, providing everything out of his own resources, making us recipients of kindness and love, drawing us to himself. Is there any greater happiness? The answer is no. The world occupies itself. I need a hobby. I have to do hard things at work, but I have a hobby to make me happy. I have these interests that I'm pursuing. And I have money that I'm, I have available to spend on these things. And, and this is relief, and this is refreshment, and this is happiness. And it is all, it's all grabbing wind, it's slipping through your fingers day after day. You're trying to grab a fistful of happiness, and you open your hand, and nothing is there. It is passed through. And the pursuits of pleasure, they end up in complete bankruptcy. I mean, you look at the annals of history. I just finished a, a dual biography in my, night, my bedtime reading of, of Bach on the one hand and Frederick the Great. And what an incredible contrast. And there's Frederick the Great, this great Prussian emperor. And he, he, he was absolutely, from the days of his youth, intoxicated with self-gratification. And what a miserable miserable illustration of the pursuit of pleasure. He ends his life miserable, alone, and his only wish is to be buried next to his two greyhound dogs. There's the great Prussian emperor of Europe who's exhausted the pursuits of pleasure and been left with nothing the Lord comes to us and he says, Christian, is there any greater happiness? No. Here you have a consoled conscience, a conscience that's quiet within you. You can be brave under trial. And there's nothing, the, the, the sufferings of soul, the sufferings of body, the persecution of enemies, none of these things can rob you of your happiness. Your happiness is not dependent on your circumstances. It's not dependent on how things are going in life. There's a deep well that the Lord has given to us that cannot be exhausted. We find that the gate to heaven is here on earth. The door is called the gospel. We enter into Christ here in order that we might enter into glory later. He appears now in his word, in the mirror of his word. But then, Christian, you will, he will appear before you face to face. And if you can say in a measure, you know what? I know something of real spiritual joy. 
I know something of it. I have a whiff, a taste. I've, I've, I've handled it, albeit briefly, perhaps. If you've known anything of true joy here, and you know how incomparable it is to the false joys of the world, how will the joy that you have now compare to the joy of standing before Christ when he appears not in the mirror of his word, but in the fullness of his person. The worldling, the unconverted, are blind. The Bible says that they see no beauty in him, that they might esteem him. They know no true happiness, and they know no rest until they find their rest, until you find your rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. But Christian, there is great comfort here. There is great comfort that the Lord promises he will never rob us of our joy because he'll never rob us of himself. We do not appear before God without Christ, but in Christ. Our appearance before the Lord, acceptable in his sight, is a byproduct of his appearance before us in kindness and love. And so we see the Savior has appeared. Secondly, we see salvation was accomplished. Secondly, salvation was accomplished. Look at verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. But according to his mercy he saved us. The Lord comes and he unveils his righteousness. This is what it means. Here's holiness, here's righteousness, here's perfection, here's law keeping. Here is who God is and therefore what God requires to have any friendship and fellowship with him. His righteousness is unveiled and what happens? Our righteousness, so-called righteousness, and our unrighteousness is unraveled. It's as if the display of Christ is a nuclear bomb. It obliterates our pretended righteousness. It decimates our pretended righteousness. Here is the Son of Man, blinding perfection and righteousness. You want to see what God requires of you? Study the Lord Jesus. That is what God requires. Not one fraction of a degree less. The fact is that only the Lord Jesus Christ can provide what God requires and what we find in him. Paul tells Titus that this, is, this salvation is accomplished, and he tells us what it is not and what it is. He says it's not merit, it's mercy. It's not merit. It's not your works of righteousness. It is mercy. These two things are contradictory. They cannot be reconciled. Works, your works of righteousness can never, ever be reconciled with his mercy. It's his will versus our will, not our works of righteousness. That means nothing in us, nothing that can be found in us inclines God to save us. God does not look down through the annals of history and say, well, here's something small I can work with. Here's something that attracts my attention. Here's something that inclines me to notice or pursue or save a soul. Absolutely nothing inside us inclines God to save us. It is free grace. It is given freely. No merit, no work, no payment. It is him bestowing on us what we don't deserve and cannot earn, not our works of righteousness. And so we cannot. We cannot take a posture of goodness. The Lord Jesus says, I didn't come to save the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. If you consider yourself righteous, you are excluding yourself from the path of salvation. 
You have to be broken before God will bind you. You have to recognize your neediness. God is coming this morning to search some of you out. The Lord is coming for you today. He's coming in and among you and he's searching you out. And every garment you wear for presentation woven from your own hand, he strips off. So there are some of you are and you think, well, I'll pull down this garment. I, I've prayed and I, I, I've, I've sought to pray regularly and read my Bible. I'll put that on as I come to church. And the Lord comes in his word and he strips that garment off of you and exposes your nakedness. Others say, well, I, I can't do much, but I'll take down this, this, uh, this coat of church attendance and I'll put it on. And look, you know, I'm not staying at home and watching football. I'm going uh, to church. Surely this speaks of something. Surely this has something in it that will please God and make me acceptable to him. And the Lord comes to you this morning in the preaching of his word. And he says, not by any works of righteousness which you have done. He's stripping that coat off of you and exposing your nakedness. Others say, well, I've dealt in honestly, I, honesty. I've tried to be an honest person at work and in my family. And I, you know, I'm going to take down this shirt of honesty and put it on. And I can commend the fact that I, I tell the truth and, and, speak to, and speak and act with integrity. And the Lord strips you naked. And he says, you will not be found in my sight with such rags which defile you with their putrid stench. Your kindness your charity, your diligence, your attempt to make a living and provide for your family, your attempt to, to deal kindly with other people, all of this, all of this is exposing you this morning. You are foul and full of stench. You deserve for the ground underneath your pew to open up and swallow you into the abyss of hell without any hope of relief. Thank God he's not given you what you deserve and have merited and have earned. And he has spared you for at least one more sermon. You're not promised another, but he has spared you for this sermon. And he comes in and among you this morning and he is searching you out. And he is laying bare the filth of our own righteousness. Do not offer merit when God comes offering mercy. Do not offer your merit to him when he comes offering his mercy to you. There is a bottomless sea of mercy. What we need, what God promises to give you, is mercy. And you must receive that promise by faith. All of that mercy is where? Where is it? It's all being traced back to verse 4. The love of God our Savior, saving us from sin by grace. Why is it that God comes offering mercy? How is it that God comes offering mercy? If you don't deserve it, and if you can't earn it, how is it that God can give you mercy? Well, I'll tell you. The only way he can give you mercy is because he gave no mercy to his son. No mercy to his son means only mercy for the believing sinner. The Lord Jesus Christ appeared in love and kindness. And he sets, set forth his glory in that spectacle upon the cross. And there upon the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ said, No mercy for me. Not a drop of mercy for me. I am here standing not in my place. I am not dying for my sin. But I, I am bearing the sins of my people. Christ appeared in love before the world and before his father, and he was seen as the quintessential sum of sin and sinners. 
And the Father said there is only one right way in which sin can be addressed. Unrelenting wrath. Righteousness must be executed. And Christ as a substitute said, I will pay in full those demands. No mercy for the Savior. That's how God comes and can say, because of who my son is, because of the display of his kindness and love toward the likes of wretched people like you and me, it is because of that that it is only mercy for his people. The cross displays this mercy in all of its fullness. You know, the difference between the unconverted person here this morning and the Christian has absolutely nothing to do with what is deserved. There is not a shred of difference between the unconverted who are looking at me in this pulpit and the Christian hearing God's word preached. No difference, my friends, in terms of what is deserved. Both, all of us, warrant the same thing. The difference is that the believer receives mercy. The passage says, according to his mercy, he saved us. Thirdly, we have salvation. Salvation is applied. Thirdly, salvation is applied. Two things here, both regeneration and renewing the Holy Ghost. Salvation is applied. It's accomplished once and for all by Christ, and it is applied by God to the individual Christian. This is appropriation. All that Christ has procured for us has to be appropriated. We have to be able to receive it. It has to be applied to our own souls. Christ died, but the question in your mind this morning ought to be, and the assertion that by faith you ought to yearn to say, is not only Christ died, most of you will acknowledge that. Not only Christ is able to save sinners, most of you are going to acknowledge that. But can you say Christ died for me? Can you say Christ has saved me from my sin? Every covenant child can repeat, Christ died for sinners. Christ is able to save any and every sinner. The question is, has Christ saved you, sinner? Has he saved you? That's the question. He says that he comes to his people with the washing of regeneration. This is signified and sealed, as we've noted on another occasion, in baptism. Water, a picture of the blood of Jesus being sprinkled upon his people, the spirit being poured out upon his people being brought into union with the Lord Jesus Christ. This washing of regeneration. Regeneration is the same thing as being born again. Two words for the same thing. Jesus says, ye must be born again to Nicodemus in John 3. He's saying, ye must be regenerated. Regeneration is this. You're given a new nature. Not the one that is described in verse 3. You're given a new nature a new life, a new heart, a new spirit. God's spirit dwells in you. And so regeneration is what God does to us, not what we do at all. In fact, we're passive in regeneration. The spirit regenerates us. We're passive. He's active. He's the one doing it. And it's something that happens secretly, something that happens in the hidden man. God giving us a a, a new spirit. It's what God does, not what we do. It's unilateral. It precedes faith. God regenerates us. You who are dead in trespasses and sins, he hath quickened you together in Christ. And then it goes on to talk about how we have faith, and by faith we're justified, and then the fruits that come from that in Ephesians 2. We have to have a new heart. We have to have the Holy Spirit. And then we are capable of, of believing. And God gives us the gift of faith. He gives us the gift of repentance as new creatures 
in Christ Jesus. To go to a person who's dead and blind and say, believe, believe, believe. It's like going to a graveyard and saying, breathe, breathe, breathe. To those under the tombstones, God has to give new life. You have to, he, we're born again. And by that means we are given the gift of faith as well. Jesus says to Nicodemus, you were born from below, you have physical life, but you have to be born from above and have spiritual life. Some of you are tempted to say, well, minister, dead is a strong word. We know what dead is. We know what that looks like. A dead person is like an inanimate object, like a stone. They don't blink, they don't see, they don't hear, they don't taste, they don't speak, they don't breathe, they don't move. Dead is, is dead. You're saying that people outside of Christ are dead, spiritually dead. They don't look like it. They're animated, they smile, they jump, they blink. The Bible says they physically, yes, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you, you were born. They have physical life, physical vigor. But the soul is dead. The soul can't see the truth, can't hear the truth, can't receive the truth, can't respond to the truth. It's like a stone, which is how God describes it. A heart of stone replaced by a heart of flesh. In John 3, that same passage, Jesus says to Nicodemus, without this washing of regeneration, without being born again, there's no heaven. Verily, verily, I say unto, you, unto thee, verse 5, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So there's the washing of regeneration. Secondly, there's the, there's the renewing of the Holy Ghost. This is another aspect of salvation applied. The renewing of the Holy Ghost. This is very much connected with regeneration and what follows. He renews our old nature. He's, he's transforming us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whole children are born. Whole men are born again. The whole person is born again. And the Holy Spirit, we're told, is the agent. The Holy Spirit is the one who is giving us a new heart, giving us a new spirit, and then carrying on that work, recreating us from the inside out into the likeness of the Lord Jesus. But the thing I want you to note here at the end of verse 5 and verse 6 is how this is a Trinitarian work. The renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he, this is going back to God, shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so we have all three persons of the Trinity. God sheds his Spirit through his Son upon his people. The Father is appointing salvation. Christ is accomplishing salvation. The Spirit is applying salvation. There is rich theology here. And if time would permit, I would go on at length about it. This is rich theology. You think, just briefly, the Spirit was given to Christ as the Son of Man in fullness. The Holy Spirit is actively at work in the whole incarnate ministry of the Lord Jesus. From the beginning, we go to the conception. The Holy Spirit is the one who conceived him in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And you can march right through the Bible. There he is at his baptism, the Holy Spirit descending. In the wilderness, the Holy Spirit assisting. We have references to the work of the Spirit all through his, his earthly ministry. We get to the cross. It's the work of the Spirit upholding him in this great labor. The Bible says, that the Spirit raised him from the dead. It also says elsewhere that the, he raised himself and the Father raised him. He ascends to heaven and he's given by the Father the fullness of the Holy Spirit, which he then pours out on his people. And so the work of the ministry of the Spirit in Jesus throughout his life is 
setting before us the model of the work of the Spirit, even within the, the Christian life. There is something happening in terms of representation, but there's something also happening in terms of all that God depicts for us. The Spirit is then poured out by the Lord Jesus Christ. This text says God shed it through his Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. That means this, that the Holy Spirit, who was at work in the ministry and life of Jesus, the Spirit given to Christ in fullness and glory, the same Spirit, not a portion of the Spirit, not another Spirit, not something like, it is the person, the third person of the Godhead. The same Spirit indwells us that indwelt Jesus. And so he's called in the Bible the Spirit of Christ. Christ's Spirit given to us. This morning something's happening. The Holy Spirit has to work in the, in the preaching of God's Word, in the preacher and in the act of preaching. But the same Spirit that works in the soul of a minister is working in the souls of his people. The same Spirit. It's one great work which is being unfolded and carried forward under his blessing. And that spirit still abides upon the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. In verse 6, it says, shed abundantly. This is the gift of the spirit given to all Christians, poured out, and the word is literally richly, poured out richly upon us. I'll never forget the first time going to Niagara, to the, the falls at Niagara, as a little child, getting on the little boat with my parents and being taking up the boat. They try to get you close to the waterfall and you're in your rain gear and it's all coming down and then they back you up and you dock and get off and so on. I remember as a little kid just overwhelmed at the volume. It seemed incomprehensible. That's the picture. That's the picture. The Lord is shedding abundantly upon his people, Niagara style, the Holy Spirit upon us, lavishing on us with the Spirit, the graces of the Spirit. Are you seeing his mercy this morning? Are you seeing the mercy that God is showing, how he saved us in mercy? God himself in mercy dwells in us. The Spirit of God dwells in every Christian. You can't be a Christian and not have the Spirit. Romans 8, verse 9, make that clear. It is impossible. There aren't Christians who don't have the Spirit. Every Christian has the Spirit. Romans 8, 9, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And so here we see the Spirit being lavished, and it is all bestowed upon us by the mediation of the Son. It is through the mediation of Christ that the Spirit is communicated to us. In John 1, it's put this way in verse 16, And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. His salvation is full, and it is free. And so you, you lack grace, you lack any grace, you're to flee to the triune God, the Father who gives through the Son the fullness of the Spirit. Here God gives to you. You say, I lack grace. It's found in bounty and plenty and in infinite degree in the person of our, our God. Have you received grace? You say, I, I, I have received grace. I'm a Christian will then humbly give gratitude to this triune God. Acknowledge that it is all through him and for him and to him. That all the glory goes to him. The Spirit is shed upon us abundantly. Just as water washes filth and water extinguishes flames and water quenches thirst and water softens hard earth. The Spirit of God does likewise. 
cleansing the soul, extinguishing the fires of sin, quenching our, our spiritual thirst, softening our hearts before him. And now we come full swing because Paul began this whole theme by saying at the beginning, you need to show meekness because you have received meekness. You look at how God has dealt with us. And he says, other people are ugly, they're mean, they're selfish, they're proud, they're malicious, they're cruel. You're to deal in meekness because you are a wretched sinner who received meekness at God's hand. And not in tiny little pieces, but in overwhelming abundance. Anything anyone has ever said or done to you, or not said or done that they should have, is trifling. It's trifling. The meanest, cruelest, most difficult thing that's ever been done is trifling in comparison to what provocations we have raised against the Lord. And he has dealt with us in mercy, abundant mercy. And we likewise were not only to deal in meekness with all men as recipients of grace, displaying gospel grace, we're to do so abundantly, not just enough to appease our conscience, not just enough in order to be able to check it off the list. You know, I think, as I've said in, in maybe the last couple of months, God deals generously with us. We deal with others as God has dealt with us. You have a, a horrible view of God that causes you to deal horribly with others. God lavishes upon us generosity. And when we're kind of, when we're the opposite of generosity, we are reflecting our view of God. And so I'm not talking here just about what we do with our goods and dealing generously with people. I'm talking here about dealing generously with those who have mistreated us. Lavishing kindness, giving abundant meekness, forbearance and patience, going way and be of, above and beyond, and showing forbearance to them. What a deal in mercy. Well, the Savior has appeared. Salvation is accomplished and applied to needy sinners such as us this morning. May we rejoice in that gospel and its grace, and may it strengthen and fortify us as we seek to walk before him. Let's stand together for prayer. Almighty God in heaven, we, we cannot adequately express we cannot adequately feel, much less express, our love, our depth of gratitude in response to your saving us in mercy. We are thankful that you have called us to put away our merit, to lay hold of mercy this day. We are thankful, O oh Lord, that you have appeared in love the visage of your Son. And we ask, O Lord, that you would so work by that Spirit whom you pour out, that you would work by the Spirit among those who are gathered here. Do not allow the hard-hearted to pass from under the preaching of your gospel. Lord, we ask that you would give them life and pursue them. We pray for the Christian weary in sin, that he or she might find great gales of refreshment as we savor again the gospel of your grace this day and rejoice in all of the implications for us. May all of this, O Lord, furnish us with help to glorify and enjoy you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together from Psalm 85. Verses 8 to 13. 
Psalm 85, verses 8 to 13, the tune is University, tune number 141, tune 141, verse 8, these are words to the Christian, I'll hear what God the Lord will speak, to his folk he'll speak peace, and to his saints, but let them not return to foolishness. Verses, eight, or verses 10 and 11, truth met with mercy, righteousness and peace kissed mutually, truth springs from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven high. Let's sing verses 8 to 13, tune 141. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.